I still feel at home. I've been by it often enough, and uh, I have classes occasionally in our own School of Social Work at St. Louis University, which I understand was, was the creation of the same architect who did this building. And then besides, I find at least three familiar faces here. Uh, Tom uh, Farrell, whom of course I've had in uh, class, and Betty Pollard, whom I had in class uh, uh, a few years ago, and whom I last saw on an airplane <laughs> some months ago. And then Hattie Jackson, whom I met down at St. Louis U this last uh, year, and so I'm very happy to be here with you. Now, I understand that my task is to try to talk to you. Would you mind if I took my jacket off? It's a little bit warmer in here than I'm used to. Um, I might be doing standing on my head up here before I'm through anyhow. I might mention about this taping so it'll be on the record. It's all right to tape it, but please do not transcribe it from the tape in any way, writing, typing, print, or anything else, because you'll get into trouble with copyright if you do, it, or I'll get into trouble, or all of us will get into trouble. I understand that I'm to talk to you about uh, problems of the media and the teaching of writing and of other modes of communication as they might um, exist here in Forest Park Community College. Now, of course, you know a lot better than I do what the problems are that exist right here. So the best I can hope to do is say some things which, for one reason or, no or another, I think would be relevant to you and which you can possibly translate into uh, uh, your own um, situation. What I think I'll do, since we have an hour and a half, right, Tom, uh, is talk for about the ordinary class lecture time, 45, 50 minutes or so, and uh, or, or less than that if you seem to get fatigued. And then after that, we'll, uh, we'll ask you for questions or remarks um, or any kind of discussion you'd like to have. Now, let's start with something that's happened to all of us. I suppose that everybody in this room has some time or other in his or her life had a teacher uh, who feels euphoric after a nice, relaxed summer, but hasn't got the uh, course organized too well at the beginning of the year, start off by saying, all right, everybody write a, do they still call it a composition? That's what they used to do when I was in school. A paper on how I spent my summer vacation. <coughs> I see from the smiles that that's happened to almost everybody. I can't ever remember it as having happened to me, as a matter of fact, which probably means that it did happen, but the experience was so traumatic that my <laughs> psyche immediately suppressed it. Now, um, what's the problem here? You see, the teacher thinks he's being very smart or she's being very smart by um, asking the student to write about something that's close to him. Well, it, doesn't, it isn't self-evident that it's easy to write about something that's close to you, you know. A lot of things that are close to you are the most difficult things to talk about. But what is the student's real problem in writing a paper like that? If he were... Uh, more alert than he probably is, or more alert maybe than the teacher, he would ask the teacher, who wants to know? That's his problem. Grandma, I never tell grandma. Mom and dad, not the fun parts. <laughs> the guys, imagine telling all the guys, you guys sit down there now and I'm going to talk to you for the next half hour on how I spent my summer vacation. That would really go over, wouldn't it? The teacher, often when you ask this question, you say, well, uh, he can write it for the teacher. But the only conceivable situation in which he would tell the teacher how he spent his summer vacation is if the teacher asks him to write a paper on how he spent his summer vacation. So that doesn't solve the problem. It just restates it. it this is the problem, finding the pe whom you're going to write for. How do you do that? The, um, there are ways. And I can suggest one way, which is the way I would usually solve a problem like this, and I know many other people would solve it. You've read um, Huckleberry Finn. You've read Mark Twain. And you think, well, I think I can make my summer vacation sound like that. I can make like Mark Twain. Whoever it was that Mark Twain was writing for, that's who I'm going to write for. The trouble is, it was, of course, and, and this will work. This will work. The trouble is that Mark Twain had the same problem, didn't he, when he sat down to write. 
How did he solve it? Well, there was a literature already. There were a lot of people who were writing for the Midwestern and Southern newspapers about our big rivers. Uh, it was a newspaper uh, subject, and Mark Twain had been a journalist, as you know. In particular, Captain Isaiah Sellers, from whom I think he got the name Mark Twain, if somebody hasn't disproved that by now. Uh, I mean, he picked up the, the use of the, the word. The, the term is actually a term that's used by uh, uh, rivermen for soundings as they go along the river. Uh, Isaiah Sellers, in particular, used to write in a vein which Mark Twain could imitate, but he changed it a little bit. And where Sellers was rather owlish, solemn. Uh, Mark Twain uh, put in his own nervous kind of humor. And uh, so he had his problem solved. But where did Isaiah Sellers get it? Find out whom to write for. You see, the problem in writing is finding whom to write for. Let me give you another example. See, it, it, just to sum up there a minute, you see the real problem in writing how I spent my summer vacation is that you never tell anybody how you spent your summer vacation, except when you're writing a paper, how I spent my summer vacation. That's the problem you have to solve. There are lots of things that are close to you, but you have to tell them to somebody. Now let's take another example. I'm going to give you the first words of Hemingway's novel, A Farewell to Arms, and see if anybody can tell me why, what's so typically Hemingway in this passage. In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. In the bed of the river there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun, and the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channel. What's so Hemingway about that? That is real vintage Hemingway. There's no doubt about it. In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and plain into the mountains. In the bed of the river, there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun. And the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channels. Anybody want to... Uh, venture a, a guess or a statement? <laughs> Maybe I am. <laughs> Maybe, no, no, I'm not trying to suck you in. I, I, want, I want to make the point what it is. I just want to see if anybody can, can, can uh, get at it before I do. A lot of people say it's because Hemingway's style is straightforward, unadorned, lacking in qualifiers, close-lipped. Well, it's all these things, but so are a lot of other things that don't sound like Hemingway at all. Or Hemingway uses a lot of and. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and, 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 Genesis goes on and on that way, but Genesis doesn't sound like Hemingway. <laughs> There's a lot in the Bible that's connected with and. <coughs> the, a feature more distinctive of Hemingway's style is the way he fictionalizes his reader. What he makes his reader imagine he is. And this fictionalizing is signaled by the way Hemingway uses the the and the that. Those are the words that make the style. In the late summer of that year, what year? The reader gathers, there's no need to explain that. We lived in a house in a village that looked across the river. What river? The river. In the plain in the mountains, in the bed of the river. Remember that river, that mountain, or those mountains, the plain? We've somehow been there together, haven't we? See, the Hemingway reader is being cast in the role of a close companion along the river, the plain. Normally, when we start talking about something, we say there was a plain there, and after we've got the plain introduced, then we say the, don't we? That indicates that you're familiar with it. But the game the reader has to play with Hemingway, not always or exclusively, but pretty generally with Hemingway, Hemingway, is that he has been there with the man who's telling the story, with the voice who's telling the story, the persona. This is one reason why the writer is tight-lipped. Description would bore you. You've been there with me. 
What description there is comes in the guise of pointing and verbal gestures, recalling humdrum familiar details, like this. In the bed of the river there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun. Remember how they looked? The known world. Not presentation, but recall. The writer needs only to point, because what does Hemingway, Hemingway's voice really want to tell you? He's not interested at all in the description. He wants to tell you how he felt. This is why he's always on the verge of uh, uh, slipping into dripping sentimentalism. The, the, his feelings, too, are something he treats, though, as though you also had shared. Well, you might not have been quite aware of it at, at the time. He can tell you what was going on inside him and count on sympathy because you were there. You know. You really know. That's the, that's the Hemingway uh, tactic. The reader has a well-marked role assigned him by Hemingway. He's a companion in arms, somewhat later become a confidant. It's a very flattering role. Hemingway readers are encouraged to cultivate very high self-esteem. Now, let's ask the question where, where this style came from. Can you think of any writer earlier than Hemingway who does this? Can you think of any writing in classical antiquity, in the Middle Ages, in the Renaissance, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, where the reader is supposed to pretend he's been there with the writer? Does Dickens write this way? Does George Eliot write this way? Does Jane Austen write this way? Does Sir Philip Sidney write this way in the Arcadia? Does Pope write this way? No, there's nothing, nothing there, nothing at all. They would have thought it was, uh, how, how, would a, how would a person in the Shakespeare's day have reacted to this kind of thing? They would have said, them, they wouldn't have been interested in it, that's for <laughs> sure. Because they wouldn't have known what to, what to do. They wouldn't have known what to do. They would have thought it was childish. Infantile. The man doesn't know how to write. He's, he's not, not with it. Now where, but Hemingway must have built on something. See, Hemingway was popular right away, and Faulkner wasn't. So this means that Hemingway wasn't doing anything that was very different from something that people were used to. Where did they find, where did they found this buddy-buddy relationship between the writer and the reader? Are there any places it's tied, actually, to the modes of communication, very, very directly, to the media. Where do you find uh, a kind of warm feeling between the reader and, and the uh, writer based on a kind of fiction that the reader was at least almost there? Like bud, this buddy-buddy relationship. Not really. You weren't, didn't go through the looking glass with, uh, it's going to be a tough milieu. It's going to be this kind of toughness that, that's, that's uh, sentimental, real, real sentimental toughness. A real lot of, lot of children's stories are written that way. Yes, they're written that way now. But remember, there weren't any children's stories till 1790 in the whole world. I've read two candidates. Uh, one would be the Canterbury Tales and the other one would be Sam We'll come to the Canterbury Tales, but Chaucer doesn't pretend that the reader was there. He pretends, he's, he's trying to solve a similar problem. That's a very good instance. He, he, but he pretends that he was with the, the pilgrim, pilgrims. We'll come to that in a moment. But something, this what I'm thinking of is much more modern. Sam Johnson's dictionary. Well, <laughs> all right, Sam Johnson. Yes, I know you are. Sam Johnson's milieu is probably the earliest instance, but I think rather than Sam Johnson's dictionary, you should turn to the Coffee House Society of Addison and Steele in the Spectator. But it's that world. But that still is a little bit, not quite this, there's something closer. Something closer. In our own century, before Hemingway, he did this kind of writing too. Anybody? Well, I can almost say writing, but I want to say the radio is like this. Radio is now, but you see, Time Magazine is just this Hemingway style. That's mm -hmm. all Time is. I mean, this is all over everywhere. Time just took Hemingway style and added to the 
to this buddy-buddy thing, they added omniscience. They can tell you what a, the head of state is thinking of when a telephone call wakes him out of sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> they do. They, I can give you an instance of that. Yeah. And what he's thinking of when he goes back to bed at night. They add omniscience. So if you think the reader has, has high self-esteem when he reads Hemingway, <laughs> when you read Time, you're just in the company of the gods. You know, you know everything. Uh, but uh, where do you get this kind of toughness, the buddy-buddy thing, the, the male bonding pattern? Sports writing, don't you? And war reporting. And Hemingway did both of them. You see, these are both things where the buddy relationship is important. You depend on the other man. It's extremely important that then you have this, what's called that male bonding pattern existing there. Moreover, note that these two things developed Modern reporting and modern sports writing developed as a result of electronic communications, the telegraph, didn't they? Once you had the telegraph, you could get on the papers on the streets in St. Louis a story about something in, in the afternoon, a story about something that just happened a few hours before. This meant that the person who was reading it was almost there. And it was feasible to make him feel that he'd been in, in on the action. And this is the thing that produces this style. But it would be it have been absolutely undigestible to anybody before in, in really early days. Now, you could do what I'm suggesting here is, you see, I'm more than suggesting, I'm stating this. The writer's audience is always a fiction. You never write for real people the way they really are. It is impossible. See, I want to write a, a paper. A, uh, a book that's going to be read by 10,000 people, so everybody get out of the room. I don't want any of those 10,000 people around, it, around me. I want to be all alone. Now that is not a natural condition to be in. The, a, a writer has to be able to imagine these people who aren't there, and they have to be able to imagine uh, the, themselves as the kind of people that he wants them to imagine them to be. Hemingway's reader has to be able to imagine that he was there with the writer. Now you see, to Sir Philip Sidney this would have sounded silly, because Sidney in his, uh, in his defense of poetry says that the purpose of a poet, and by poet he means what we call a creative writer, is to docere moveri delectare, to teach, to move, and delight. And mostly he meant to teach, not to teach in any uh, kind of, of, uh, of art, uh, stiff, didactic way, but to tell somebody something he didn't know. And Hemingway is telling you all the things you did know, because you've been there with him. You see, it would, it would have gone completely against his grain. Now, um, there is a history of the way in which readers fictionalize their roles. It's never been written. There's a history of these roles, just as there is a history of, of, the, of, of literary genre. Um, let's see, uh, somebody here mentioned Chaucer. People have had this problem of fictionalizing a reader from the beginning. And we might as well admit that even for oral performance, there's a certain amount of fictionalizing done. Um, when in Greek, in Homeric Greek, uh, Homer got up to sing his songs of the wars of Troy, he put on his epic singer's hat, and all the people who listened to him put on, put on their epic listeners at, and they better because he was talking a language that no Greek ever taught. You could understand it if you could understand Homeric Greek, but nobody talked this way except when they were telling, uh, ep singing epic stories. We have a bit of this, don't we, in fairy stories. Once upon a time, you never, once upon a time outside of fairy stories, and people outside of fairy stories don't say fee, fi, fo, fum, and that kind of nonsense. There's a whole lingo that goes with this, and there is a kind of fictionalizing there, but the fictionalizing with an audience is quite different because besides this, these conventions, there is also the real interaction of the audience, which the, the oral performer always has to deal with. I had, a, I had students at St. Louis U in the past few years. I think they were in the same year, but maybe they were in successive years. A man from uh, an Igbo from Nigeria and a man from Western Ireland. And I asked them, do you have uh, people who tell stories in your cultures? And they said, sure we do. Well, are they special people? Yes. They, they have to learn. Some people are better at this than others. And after a while, there are just certain ones that everybody goes to to tell stories. These are the storytellers. 
They know how to do it. Do they have a special lingo? Sure they do. They have formulas? Sure. They got fee, fi, fo, fum, and all that kind of stuff. The rosy finger dawn and the wine dark sea and all that. That's, that's part of it all over the world. Well, I said, how long does it take to tell a story? And the man from Africa says, how long? Well, 10 minutes, half hour, an hour. I said, the same story? He says, sure, the same story. Depends on how the audience reacts. The Irishman told me exactly the same thing. And he added, um, you always know what he's going to say, but you just don't know how long it's going to take him to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't this the way it is when you tell a fairy story? If you're really good, you can make it long, can't you? You can get Little Red Riding Hood and have those wolf's fangs dripping more and more, you know, and the woods get darker and darker. You can, a, a good oral story, oral performer is, is verbose, lengthy, just the opposite of right. So uh, the, the point is here that there is, the, the oral, for oral performance, there is a kind of fictionalizing, but it's only partial because you've got a real audience, and if they get impatient, you better shorten your story or do something to pep it up. The writer doesn't have any of that at all. He's got to fictionalize the thing out of a whole cloth. Now, what, this has been a problem for some time. And uh, someone here mentioned Chaucer. Let's take a look at what at Chaucer's own performance. See, Chaucer had a problem with the readers of the Canterbury Tales. Nobody had been telling stories like this to them in English. There was no established tradition. The readers didn't know what they were supposed to pretend to do, pretend to be. So Chaucer solved it. <coughs> First, he said, there's a pilgrimage of people going to Canterbury. This was a real place. And they were going from London along uh, Watling Road, the old Roman road. And London's a real place. And they sounded like pretty real people. But to make it real real, Chaucer put himself in it. See, this is a signal to the people to, re to imagine something like, as, an, as a novel reader's signal to imagine, that these are people like the people you find next door, which is not what you imagine when you're listening to the Iliad or the Odyssey, that kind of thing, or even when you're listening to Frankie and John. Those are different conventions. So Chaucer, you see, was giving his readers signals as to how they're supposed to fictionalize themselves. He was finding them that way. The, 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 we, you, you, there's been a lot of ink spilled about um, the great genius of Chaucer in devising this frame story, which of course he got from Boccaccio. It wasn't any genius at all. He was in a, on the spot. He solved a problem. That's all he did. He had a problem and he solved it. He solved it because Boccaccio had pointed the way, and if you want to go back, you can find out what the antecedents of Boccaccio were because there was always somebody before that who did something a bit like this that gave Boccaccio the idea and that gave Boccaccio's readers some kind of idea as to what they were going to have to do with themselves. When you go, in, go into, the, into the 16th century, you can find a, a man like John Lilly or Tom Nash and the Unfortunate Traveler. When they're, where they're trying to work out with their readers the roles that the readers are supposed to play. What happens here is very interesting in terms of the media. We've seen how Hemingway's, the Hemingway's style depends upon telegraphy, upon quick exchange. Um, the manuscript culture before print had preserved a very heavy oral residue. It was always fascinated with rhetoric. And rhetoric is just a fancy Greek way of saying oratory. But the new medium of print, which had started about a, a hundred years or a little bit more than a hundred years before the time of Lillian Nash, was changing the whole way in which men managed their knowledge. And rhetoric was still strong in the curriculum, but there's something wrong with it. The curriculum wasn't working anymore. So Lilly reacts, if any of you know John Lilly's, how many of you know his euphues? Am I talking? Good many of you do. Uh, he reacts by hyper-rhetoricizing his text. He pumps it all up and says, here you can have it. And Nash, in, in The Unfortunate Traveler, does something like that, but then he tries all kinds of roles out on the reader. You ought to read The Unfortunate Traveler sometimes, or The Life of Jack Wilton, it's also called, because it's one of the most riotously funny things you can find in the 16th century. Um, you, you have to, and there are some pretty funny things there. Most of the funniest things, because the English is really quite up to the wit of the Latin at that time, but Nash's is in English and it's extremely witty. Uh, you have to be, pretend that you're listening to a political orator 
that you're a participant in a scholastic disputation, a hanger-on at a kind of 16th century Woodstock uh, festival, a camp follower uh, hanging around an army and listening to the stories the, the, the uh, soldiers tell, a uh, reader of Italian revenge stories in 16th century true confessions, one of these things right after another. Nash is trying on all kinds of, of, of roles, and so on. Now, I think I've said enough to indicate here the kind of thing that, that a student is faced with when he's asked to write that paper on how I spent my summer vacation. <laughs> he's got to fictionalize. You always have to fictionalize a reader, and, and this means fictionalizing yourself when you are writing. Now, I've, I've given an inst the instances here, instances here in, in terms of prose narrative, but would this be true of all writing? It is absolutely true of all writing without any exception. It's true of the most scientific writing. If I, if I do a, 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 an article for a learned journal, I have to know how to fictionalize this audience. You never put in William Shakespeare, comma, a well-known Elizabethan dramatist, comma. That's out. <laughs> well, you know, that's one of the things. Your students don't know you're not supposed to do that. That's one of their problems. You all laugh because you know that. That's what they've got to know. You know how to fictionalize this audience. You've read these things. There are other things that you say, as everybody knows, and then you say it. Because you know that all your readers have to pretend they know this, but you know that most of them don't. But it's the kind of thing that nobody can afford to admit he doesn't know, and you have to know what those things are that they fictionalize that way. And so on through the whole gamut. Of, uh, this is true of writing a treatise on mathematics. It's true about all writing. There's always that fiction. Is it true about a letter? Of course it's true about a letter. You say, Dear John. You never call him Dear John in your life. He's not Dear John except when you write a letter. And if you try that other thing, Hi John, that's worse. That means I know I'm supposed to say Dear John, but that kind of fiction won't work, so I'll try another one. Now you've got two of them. And you've got to fictionalize a mood for him. You've got to write to him and, as though he were in some kind of mood. You don't know what mood he's in. When he picks up the letter, he's got to match the mood you've given him. When, when we talk to one another, we, we try a little something to see what the mood is, but we, and we make adjustments. You can't do that in a letter. This is why it's hard. It's, you, you, now, how do, you, how do you solve the problem? Reading. There is no other way. There is no way to solve this problem except by reading. You cannot teach students to write who don't read. There's no way. This is true even, even uh, in, to top it all of a diary, isn't it? You might say a diary isn't fictionalized. It's the most fictionalized. That's the most fictionalized writing you can have. First of all, you're, you're pre you pretend you're talking to yourself for an hour on end. You never do this. And secondly, you're writing. And when, some, when you're writing to somebody, you're writing, you have to pretend the person isn't there. So you're talking to yourself for an hour on end, which you never do, pretending you're not there while you're doing it. And whom are you talking to? The, way, the person you think you are, the person you think other people think you are, the person that you'd like other people to think you are, the way you're going to be 20 years from now, the way you hope you'll be 20 years from now. These are the problems. This is why people write diaries. Uh, at the time when they're having their identity crises, at, at the, in late, their late teens and early 20s. This is the great diary, diary writing period. They're fictionalizing different things to see what, what they can match. And uh, diaries, of course, are different in different ages, aren't they? If you re read a diary today, it doesn't sound like uh, a diary that's written in the 18th century because you don't fictionalize yourself the same way. You can't. So the only, the, you see what, a, what, a, what a, the problem a student has is the problem of fictionalizing an audience. He's got to be able to uh, create in his imagination some kind of role for the people he's writing for. And it has to be a feasible role that the readers can play. And the only way he can find that out is by finding out what other people have done. There is no other way. There is no way to start writing from scratch. Now, let me go off to, we can come back to that in the discussion. Well, I might add this. I would say, uh, to, to give a statistic, this is uh, 
uh, off the top of my head and doesn't really mean much, but it gives some idea of the state of affairs as I see them. For every sentence that a student gives off with, he has to have read maybe five or 6,000. I think that's about the way it is, if the sentence is really worthwhile. You've got to be full of this stuff or it won't come out. Now you can, of course, put a student down, and I'm aware of the, of the very fine experiments that you're doing here in uh, trying to get students who are very oral and not given to writing to get over the fear of uh, just that pen and just to s put something down. That was, as you found, I understand, that'll only work for a while. Then you, you've got to get over the hurdle or something. Next thing is to get them to write something and somebody will read. Now, let's take up a, a different subject, but a related one. I've talked about the um, influence of the media on these conventions of um, fictionalizing readers, which also, of course, means fictionalizing the role of the writer. And I'd like to say something about the relationship of new media to old. Often, you hear the opinion voiced that new media are going to wipe out the old. You even hear people say that television has ended books. Now, anybody who says that is really out of contact with reality, and I mean that in all seriousness. All you have to do is go into any bus depot or, or uh, I was going to say railway station, but nobody goes there anymore, or uh, airport or drugstore to see or just look at the publisher's figure. There are always more books published this year than there were the year before. And there were more published last year than the year before that. This is the way it is. That's utter nonsense to say that there are, the television has wiped out books. It hasn't. I'm absolutely sure that my students read far more than we did. Remember that in the old days, uh, what a lot of people, and I mean old days when I was a boy in school, but a lot of people, uh, a lot of people are under the illusion that students uh, did a lot of reading in class. What they did was a lot of reciting. They spent the greater part of the class day saying things out loud. They weren't reading at all. A little bit of reading, lots of reciting. You remember how they used to be? All those recitations of everything. Uh, reading is still going on, but things have changed. And how have they changed? Well, let's go all the way back to the beginning to the time before there was no, before there was any writing at all. Now this is very difficult for us to imagine what, what, what an oral culture is like, a totally oral culture, where nobody can write and nobody has even thought of the possibility of writing. In a culture like this, remember, nobody has ever looked up anything. When anybody was born, when anybody died, what belongs to whom, when, when anything happened. In fact, they don't have the idea of looking up. See, remember to say, to look up something, that means you know how to read and write. All they can do is recall. They can just say it again. See, in, in Homer's Iliad, which after all is a poem for entertainment, there are over 400 lines which give you the names and number of followers of the Greek, of the captains of the various Greek ships. This is like the city directory. But you couldn't look these up. They couldn't write. If you wanted to hear them, you had to bring in one of these singers and have him sing them to you. You had to recall it. In that kind of culture, in which maybe most of the world still lives, more or less, in that kind of culture, if you don't know something, you ask somebody. If he doesn't know, you maybe ask somebody else. When you run out of people to ask, that's the end. Nobody knows. There's no way to find out anymore until you become literate, and then you work back and figure it out a little bit, some of it anyhow. Um, in this kind of culture, you cannot have any kind of scientific treatise. You cannot talk like I'm talking. You'll, there's no way, f for instance, for, to have, nobody has ever uh, given any kind of treatise, uh, produced any kind of treatise on medicine. There's no way to do it. Imagine a tree, all you could do would be to stand up and recite a book. There's no, nobody can do that. <laughs> what do you have? You, the, the closest thing you can get to a treatise in that kind of culture is, is a series of aphorisms. Feed a cold and starve a fever. The early bird gets the worm. Ars longa vita brevis. 
Longfellow puts it in his not too good poem, art is long and time is fleeting. That's the first aphorism of Hippocrates. That's the earliest medical writing we have in the West. And it's a series of aphorisms. All you've got is sayings. You can't, you can't, you can't make a list of them. Nobody can remember them in the right order. Remember, don't forget that, that in oral cultures, although these people have fantastic memories, it's never verbatim. No oral culture in the whole world, so, so far as we can tell by massive surveys, it can recite a thing, say, as long as the Nicene Creed verbatim. They're absolutely incapable of it. They can tell you the story accurately, they can use formulas, but every time they tell it, it'll be a little bit different. So, when you get writing, something happens. Once you get writing, you can write a thing that we would call a treatise, something like Aristotle's Art of Rhetoric, which is a scientific approach to oratory. What can you say about oratory scientifically, about communication? For persuasion, scientifically. He puts it down. Or you can write a treatise on, on medicine, or a treatise on forest trees. But this means that when this kind of treatise is composed, this is a completely new experience for the human mind. No human mind had ever gone through that kind of motion, where you show that this is due to this, and this is due to this, and this is due to these three factors, and each of those are due to these four others. You can't do that in the oral culture. You can't get them lined up like that. You can't have this linear or, or, or causative development to any extent. You can get a little bit. You say, he pushed me and I fell over. Well, that's, that's causality. But you can't carry more, construct a link of more than two or three chains and, and re retain it, a, a chain of more than two or three links and retain the connections in your mind. So that these, these, these scientific type treatises, the kind of, of writing that we normally do, were a completely new experience of human mind. Nobody had ever thought those thoughts. But then, once they had thought them, and thought them out in writing, written them down, what happened to speech? Did, did, when people invented writing, did they stop talking? Of course not. First of all, the people who invented writing were the ones who talked most. Writing was invented by people in urban settings, not the nomadic hunters or their herdsmen or the farmers, but people who lived in urban settings. It was really written, invented not at all for literary purposes in the, in the, in the um, strict set, in the aesthetic sense of that term, but for um, record keeping. That's why it was first invented. People were living close and they had to keep records. So it was invented by the people who were in close together and talking more. I am sure that after they had writing they talked more than ever because they had more to talk about. But did they talk the same way? No. Once you had treatises such as Aristotle's Art of Rhetoric, or a treatise on surgery, or a treatise on logic, once you had, had experienced this kind of orderly organization of thought, you could talk that way a little bit. You could make your talk sound a little bit like writing, because you'd heard that. You knew what it was like. And you'd better do it, or you, or you wouldn't get along in the world. Because if you couldn't make your talk sound like writing, you weren't educated. And if you couldn't make it sound like writing, you really couldn't think. In, in, in the advanced kind of way that writing made it necessary to think in this scientific kind of, 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 of uh, way. So you see what's happened here is that the new medium, writing, has reinforced the old. It's made talkers talk more, but it's made them talk differently. And that's what always happens when a new medium comes in. It never wipes out the old, it always reinforces it. But it changes it so that it no longer does what it used to do the same way. So you have to, knew the no, to know the new medium or you can't use the old. The same thing happened with print. When print, when did it become necessary that we have universal literacy? Not after writing was invented, but after print was invented. Universal literacy became necessary after the Renaissance. Once you had print, everybody didn't have to be able to print, but they had to be able to do the thing that went before print, to write. And once you had print, people wrote more than ever, because they not only wrote letters now, but they wrote books for print. And these could be disseminated more, a lot more, con uh, 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 a lot more um, 
Communication took place in print, so you directed your writing toward that. But print changed writing. Earlier writers used to write either in a dialectical form, an argumentative form, or they used to get up collections of sayings. You see, until Romanticism, roughly, because print took its effect slowly, until the late 1700s, all teaching was by combat. It was a contest, a battle. You were never taught to be objective. You, you could become objective, but what you were taught was to take a stand and to defend it, or to attack the stand the other person took. If you go to the, to the uh, Vatican Film Library at St. Louis University, where we have all those 13 million pages of microfilm from the Vatican Library, there are a lot of those pages uh, come from the university media. And uh, you'll find there medical theses that a doctor defended. This is the way you got your medical degree. You, you, this disease is cured by this remedy, and you defended that against everybody who wanted to attack it. Now you, now you prove things by writing. They had never thought, you know, of writing in the Middle Ages to, to find out uh, how, how much you knew. They thought apparently it never occurred to anybody that you could find out how much a person knew by asking them to write. That came much later. They were very uh, um, oral from that point of view. But they, the, the, you, taught, you taught and thought in a dialogic form, a back and forth, an argumentative form. And when you made collections of things, if you look in early encyclopedias, the encyclopedias tend to tell you what people say. They're collections of sayings. Once you get print, though, something happens. With print, you can have indexes that really work. Now, you can, you can make indexes of manuscripts. Some of you are making manuscripts right here. You're taking notes. That's a manuscript. A manuscript's some writing material with writing on it. But I, I venture to say that you're not going to index them. It's not worthwhile for one manuscript, I, one copy. I doubt whether anybody here has ever indexed his class notes. It's not worth it. And uh, if you have uh, people copying out manuscripts in a medieval monastery with a monk up here dictating it, everybody out here copying it, you could make an index for each one, but you'd have to have a different index for every copy because the stuff isn't all on the same pages. Each copy, it's, uh, in each copy, it's, it's, the pagination is different. But once you get print, when you've got two, three, four, maybe 5,000 copies with everything exactly on the same place on the same page, then it's really, really helpful to have an index. You can spend a few days on this, and it's a great aid to everybody. And if, sure enough, within 100 years or so after print is invented, you have book titles and they advertise, cum indice locu platissimo, with a, with, a, with a very complete index, with a revised index, with two indexes, three indexes, with four indexes. They put this on the title page. Now note what this does. This changes our idea of what knowledge is. We think of a book as having contents, don't we? Contents, is that right? You think of a book as containing something? I read that uh, in, a, in something a few years ago, translation of a passage from St. Augustine in a book by Etienne Gilson. I read a, this quotation. I don't know whether Gilson had done, done it this way in French. He could have. Uh, whether it was the result just of the English translation. But anyhow, St. Augustine was made out to say in this translation, the content of this statement. Well, I said, no. There isn't even any way to say that in Latin. You couldn't say it. They never thought that way. So I went, took the trouble of going back and looking up to see what the Latin word was that the English translator, either directly from the Latin or through the French, mm -hmm. had rendered content. And the Latin word was veritas, truth. But so when St. Augustine had said the truth of this statement had come out in the modern translation as the content of this statement. You see, for the modern mind, the, the statement is a little box. It's got something in it. Well, now that's a curious way to conceive of truth, isn't it? But that's the way we do. And this is the result of print. Because we think of books as things that have labels on the back, which we call titles. And they have things in them, and you can look up and find where those things are with the index. And consequently, a modern encyclopedia, it comes to us as, or we think of it, or likely to think of it, as a mass of facts, as though nobody said them. But you know, addiction, uh, uh, an encyclopedia is just something that some people say. It can be true or not. Most of it is quite true. But it's still something that somebody says. 
Uh, Professor Max Black at Cornell was telling me a year or two ago, uh, when we were at a meeting together, that he'd been having a, a discussion with a student, um, and the, they'd, the student had disagreed with him on something or other, and he came back in a few days. He says, Professor Black, I looked up that, uh, that uh, word that we were talking about in the dictionary, and this is the definition. Did you know this? And Professor, Professor Black, yes. He said, yes, I wrote the definition, <laughs> which was true. And the student's jaw dropped. It was the first time it ever occurred to him that every one of those definitions in the dictionary was something that somebody said this word means. The, the word didn't come equipped with it. Somebody had to figure that out and say, this is what it means. You see, uh, we're, we're conditioned differently here. We think of the of print as, as providing us with things. When we think a little harder, we know it isn't that. But earlier people didn't think of a book as having content. The book said something. And it didn't. Often they didn't have titles. So uh, again, the medium has, has, has the newer medium, print, has affected writing in a different way. It's made writing more oriented toward what we today call facts. And similarly now, when, we, when we're in a new kind of world with the electronic media, the electronic media are interacting with the earlier media of print and writing and oral speech. Reinforcing the earlier ones and changing them. Let me give you an anecdote, which is a true one. This really happened to me. That will show you what is happening today. Now, one of the things that happens with electronic media is perhaps you know already, I think some of you read some things of mine, um, and incidentally, if you want to follow up on what I'm saying today, the best books to do so, the most complete treatment, is in the presence of the word. I'm going to leave uh, left with uh, Mr. Farrell here some bibliographies of uh, my books. The presence of the word is the, it will give you the most complete treatment of what I'm saying. But also, there are other lights on what I'm saying th thrown by rhetoric, romance, and technology in the human grain and the barbarian within. Well, to get back to our subject now, um, Le the electronic media have done several things. The, the ele uh, electronics have done several things to the media. They have um, brought us into a new kind of sound world. Sound means much more now than it did 50 years ago. That isn't all they've done, though. They have uh, people contrast the sound world with the linearity of a print world. Well, electronics have made the linear much more linear than it ever was. There's nothing more linear than a computer. A computer is just one thing after the other. That's all a computer is, any kind of computer. But it, it works so fast that it's, you get through all the, this sequence so fast that it's almost as though there were no sequence there. But it does increase the linearity of the world before it, infinitely almost. But it also brings us into a new kind of sound world and it's the, with, with tape recording such as we have here, telephones, radio, television. And it's that kind of sound world that I want to talk to you about now to show how the electronic age has done the same thing that these other developments has done. It's reinforced the earlier media and transformed it. A few years ago, I got a phone call from Brooklyn, New York, here in St. Louis, from a man who wanted to interview me for a book. He was putting out a book which consisted of interviews with about a dozen persons. And he had missed me when he was in St. Louis and said he'd come out um, and uh, do the interview or he could interview me back east if I, ha if I was going to be back there soon. Well, as a matter of fact, I was scheduled to be at Lehigh University within a couple of weeks after that in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I remember what time of year it was. It was Advent. It's nice to be in Bethlehem in Advent, you know, even if it isn't the real one. <laughs> And uh, they make a kind of thing of it, actually, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and do it very well. Um, so I was, while I was there, he drove over from Brooklyn, that isn't too far, and he taped me one late one afternoon, went back to his motel, slept on the tape, came back the next day and taped some more, asking me about things that he hadn't thought to ask about before. Then he took these two tapes back to Brooklyn, had them transcribed, and of course the stenographer who transcribed them um, edited them a little, they always do. He edited them some more, put, fed the two of them together, produced a manuscript, sent them to me, I edited it again, sent it back to him. 
He re-edited it, called me up on the phone, taped another 40 minutes or so by long distance phone, uh, fed, edited that, took out parts of it, put it, back, put it into the original, and sent the re-re-re-edited uh, version back to me. I edited it again, sent it back to him. There's a little flurry of, of uh, postcards, telephone calls, and that sort of thing. And finally, the manuscript was, was produced, and it's uh, come out in a book by now. But what have you got here? You've got something nobody ever said and nobody ever wrote. That's sure. There's no author. Is there? By an author, we mean a person who sits down and composes. There are lots of things in print that have no author. In print that have no author, don't, aren't there? Suppose somebody gives an extempore speech and you transcribe it, and you ask who wrote this. An author, in that sense, of a writing. Nobody wrote it. <laughs> You've got something in writing that 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 somebody composed orally. It's it's a it's a written record of an oral event. And this is that plus a lot of other things. We don't even have the terminology for this. What would you call him? The master of ceremonies? The impresario, perhaps? Walter Ong presented by George Reamer? You know, this kind of thing. <laughs> or maybe an impresario would be the best, the best uh, 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 term for this. And well, what would I be? The correspondent, exhibit one or exhibit six or wherever I was in the book? Uh, now, this sort of thing, why, why, why was it done this way? It's very simple, to make it sound informal. <laughs> That's the reason. Because writing is never informal. There is no way to write informally. And writing is not a conversation. And if you put an ordinary conversation as it really exists orally into writing, it is awful. It doesn't come off writing right, because you're not listening to a conversation you're reading. To make a conversation in writing, it has to be a different kind of thing from a real one. That's the first rule. It's not a rule, it's just a finding. At one point in the interview, uh, my interviewer said, well, look, you know, we're not really talking to one another like close friends. This isn't really a, just a friendly, informal tete-a-tete. Well, I said, of course it isn't. Who are you trying to fool here? You're, you're writing, a, you're getting up something you hope that thousands of people are going to read. You're asking me questions because you know they're going to be transcribed and edited and re-edited and finally put in a book. And I'm answering questions knowing exactly the same thing. So to make it sound very natural, he put this exchange between us in the final version. <laughs> After editing it too, to make sure it really sounded natural. <laughs> So here's where you are, you see. Uh, we're we're in, a, in an extremely complicated situation today. Now, the, the informality, you recognize how common this thing is. You can hardly pick up a magazine today that doesn't have these interviews. And, and why? Because this way you get more into print. If he hadn't done these, these interviews, there would have been one less book in the world because none of these people had time to write that book. You might say, thank God there's one less book in the world, but that would have been the situation. You notice the, the, the electronic oral media are not at all being, being used to cancel out books. They're being used to produce one more, and one more, and one more, and one more. But it's a different kind of book. It's a book with an informal tone. And once this thing has got abroad, it's going to influence the other kind of writing. So that when a person sits down to a typewriter to compose, or sits down with, a, with his pen and, and uh, paper to compose, He's likely to want to sound like one of these contrivances. As a matter of fact, Professor Andrew Gleason at Harvard, as of a few years ago, I don't know what the situation is now, if he succeeded in doing it or abandoned it, but as of a few years ago, he was trying to write an algebra in the second person to make algebra decently informal. You see, what's happened here again is the new medium has reinforced the old, produced more books than ever, more print than ever, but it's changed it. The kind of thing that's coming out as a different tone from anything that ever, ever, you ever had in print before. And this is feeding back into the old ways of writing and, and, and making them adapt themselves to the new. So where we are now is in an extremely complex situation where everything that existed in the past is still present, but is present in a different way from which it ever was in the past because it's in the present, and everything is interacting with everything else. Now having said that, maybe I've confused the issue enough that people would have some uh, um, questions or some observations to volunteer.
Yes, sir. You can't have electronic media without, uh, without literacy. My point is that electronic media will reinforce literacy, but it will be a different kind of thing. You have a tragic situation in, uh, in Egypt and in the Arab countries in general today, a, a, great, a matter of great concern to an anthropologist friend of mine at American University of Cairo, um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Hamamsi. Uh, she's very concerned about these Arabs who have go around, illiterate, completely illiterate. They go around with their little transistor radios to their ears. They're completely helpless in an electronic culture. They can't make transistor radios. They can't do anything that this kind of culture demands. They're just, and all they can do is explode the way they do. And you get things like the Six Day War. And no, it won't ripen out at all. It, there, it, is, it, is, it is certain, I would say, that people have to be more literate than ever today. But with the effect that without knowing how to read, People by watching and listening to the media can learn a lot more. They can learn facts, but they cannot learn how to think in the way in which you have to think in the, in the kind of society we live in. They cannot be effective. It is absolutely it is absolutely impossible for a person to be effective, except in very cert very special kinds of circumstances. An entertainer might be somewhat effective, but uh, but to run a business, to be in politics, no. The thought patterns. That, that you have to you have to be able to use cannot be mastered without writing. And the thought patterns that you have to be able to use to build an electronic device can't be mastered without writing. You can imagine, if you want, people who do nothing but watch these things, but they're going to be completely ineffectual members of society at the mercy of others. I don't think there's any doubt of that. You can get a certain amount of information, but you see, just having a certain amount of information, knowing that the Alps are approximately the same height as the Rockies, that doesn't get you anywhere. And so we find students do have this. They have a lot more information than we have. But that can be a handicap if you don't know how to handle it. And precisely, you see, this is one of the reasons you have to be more literate, because you've got more information. And it will cripple you if you can't get it organized. Well, I'm thinking in terms of what can be done with the media to make sure that people don't know how to do things <laughs> oh. oh, you mean that the media can victimize them? Oh, that's true. That's quite true. And I would say that, the, but that the, the, the one of the greatest protections of this is still literacy. There's a curious thing that happens with, um, to pre produce the modern world. I was at a meeting a few years ago at Turku in Finland, which was made, mo made up mostly of third world people, people from uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, the... Um, as Latin America and so on, and um, it was a very impressive thing. It, uh, it was it was run by the World Student Christian Federation, a Protestant group. Uh, it's connected with the World Council of Churches, and I was there. They had some Catholic participation, but actually I was there just as a resource person, not specifically with a Catholic group. And um, so you had um, Christians there, which admittedly are the more educated parts of these populations by and large. But uh, some of the things that they said were extremely, these, they're all young people, the college people, uh, or maybe young graduate students, people of that sort. There was a young man from Jordan who made what I considered an extremely wise observation. A lot of people were talking about bettering, they were very concerned about bettering the condition of man in all these countries. And a lot of them are talking about a revolution. We're going to have another revolution. Only it's not going to be a fiasco like all the revolutions we had before. This is going to be the real revolution that really does it. Well, the young Jordanian got up and said, forget the revolution. He says, what we have to do is to send out our young boys and girls and get them to look at something and then come back and say exactly what they saw. Now, very few people in oral cultures can do that. That comes with writing. <coughs> this is not to say that, say, our American Indians, when the Europeans first came here, were not good observers. They were excellent observers. I'm sure that you could, uh, a European would go through the woods with them, and the, and the Indian was observing all sorts of things that this European city-fied person didn't know. But the Indian couldn't say them. See, what makes the scientific world is the juncture of exact observation with exact verbal statement. And that has a, that's a long, long story. I've got something about it in the presence of the work. 
It has to do with the development of print and the use of, the use of illustrations to convey information, which comes about only really after print for some <coughs> strange reasons. It could have been used before, but there were difficulties with it. So the, um, the, uh, I th the, the, the writing, in other words, is essential. It's, it's a different kind of writing. We don't teach people to write today exactly the way in which they, which they wrote 500 years ago, but it's still an essential. Yes. yes. Oh, yes, there is. We read much, much faster than earlier people did. Uh, until, um, as certainly through, well, in classical antiquity, we know that people normally read aloud even when they read to themselves. The word uh, legere in Latin means to read out loud. A le lectura is the word that comes from legere, and it means a lecture. But what do we mean by a lecture? Something like this that's out loud. So, and when, you remember when, when uh, St. Augustine came over from his native Africa to Milan in Italy to visit the man we now know as St. Ambrose, who was Bishop Ambrose there. He says what a nice man Ambrose was, open house all day. So Augustine says, I walked in, and I found him in his study reading to himself without making any noise. Well, this shows that once in a while somebody in classical antiquity did read silently, but it also shows that it was a rare enough occurrence that if you found anybody doing this, you took out your wax tablet right away and wrote it down so you could put it in your confessions later on. <laughs> you see, and now, they, so they read that way, and through the Middle Ages, people commonly murmured when they read. You know how, how semi-literate people tend to do today, move their lips. That's the way everybody did. Uh, but uh, even a uh, even hundred years ago, people read much more slowly than now. One of the things we have to learn now is to read fast. And writing is, is written so it can be read fast. Uh, it, our, our books are much more carefully edited than, than books were in the, in the 16th century. They had nobody like a copy reader at a university press who goes over your book just with a fine tooth comb. This really happens. They'll send you back a book manuscript. Of, you said this on page 27. You want to say it here on page 236 again, or don't you? <laughs> Question mark. And this is true. The manuscript comes back with maybe two or three hundred little slips of paper like that pinned onto it, and the author has to answer all those questions. People never did that before. See, this is to make it so you can go through it that way. It's, uh, we do. We, uh, that, a lot of that rather automatically takes care of itself, I think. If you teach people to read the stuff that's around them, uh, they, uh, uh, you're teaching them to, to handle the new style reading. On the other hand, it's very good for them if they will read things in other styles, because that uh, loosens them up a little bit, too. You know, read earlier things so that they can get a different kind of feel. Literacy that, that I was brought up with you know, as a boy, um, it happened to me without TV going on. Mm -hmm. That was before TV. That's right. Does the literacy that my that that I'll need, and certainly my students, um, differ from the kind of literacy that I was brought up? Does that question make sense? Yes, yeah, sure does. That's right. Yes. Your definition of literacy. That's that's right. It does. Uh, first of all. There is the, the greater, the, the, there's more receptivity for informality in reading today. People just go for it more. See, television, for, for a strange reason, is, is a participatory um, uh, medium, and it has built into it, not on purpose, but just because that's the kind of thing it is, a kind of informality and, and um, uh, impromptu quality. Remember, the greatest scandal on television was when they found out that programs which were supposed to be unrehearsed were rehearsed. <laughs> television has to have sound for that reason, as any television engineer, because sound indicates the present use of power. Sound is always in the present. You see, you can stop a picture, a moving picture here, and have one <coughs> frame. If you stop sound, there's nothing. Sound indicates something is going on. Sound exists only when it's going out of existence. As a primitive hunter can see a buffalo and smell a buffalo and touch a buffalo and taste a buffalo when the buffalo is completely inert or dead. If he hears a buffalo, he better watch out. Something's going on. See, that's why television needs sound. Uh, it, if you saw, imagine seeing a televised uh, broadcast of an ongoing riot with no sound. It would be hard to, bo to get yourself really psychologically convinced that this is the here and now, wouldn't it? If you just put in a little musical background, it would, out of the studios, off the studio's tape, it would make it more convincing. And of course, the noises of the riot would make it more convincing still. Now, this means, uh, you see, a television gears you to a kind of pr 
presence, a kind of presence, a kind of impromptu uh, situation, a uh, relevance, and all that kind of thing. So there will be a demand for this among people today. Now, uh, that can be an advantage and it can be a disadvantage because there's two things, there are two things that human beings need in order to understand. You need proximity and you need distance. And if you can't get the distance, you're dead. And so there, the, the, uh, the reading, the literacy today uh, calls for a certain kind of a sense of relevance, a sense of the present, of on, ongoing actuality, but, and this can be crippling if that's the only thing a person has, if he doesn't step back from it and try to get perspective. But you see, this means, for instance, that, that, that history writing today is different from what it used to be. History writing, the writing of history, can no longer be just antiquarianism if it's going to be really serious history, just telling you the way it was in the past. You've got to make that past resonate with the present. Uh, you see, the kind of pattern I follow today in trying to show you how that the, the oral cultures are continuous with our own, that, that, that kind of thing is present to us, that, that, uh, that kind of sense is also one of the things that we need. All these things affect the literacy. Does that uh, come somewhere near your question? I know it, uh, the, the question is a very deep one, and, and you, you know you can't exhaust it in just a point. Uh, when you started off, you were talking about uh, Hemingway's style, mm -hmm. and uh, you were trying to figure out uh, the, where it came from. Mm -hmm. the great Richard Chelsea. Yes. And the, you did mention the oral performance, but what came to my mind at that time was uh, the theater. Now, I, I'm uh, differing that from the oral performer you talked about, the, mm -hmm. the storyteller story, mm -hmm. and that's if you have a written script, then it's usually will play within minutes. You know, that's right, that's right, yeah. Uh, as far as fictionalizing the audience goes, uh, where do you fit? Yeah, that's, this is a, a fascinating question because theater is, a, is really an interesting genre here. First of all, there's a paradox in theater. And you've touched on it when you mentioned about writing and the script and ending at a certain time and all that. The theater in its production is completely oral, isn't it? I mean, you talk. Yeah. But it is the first literary genre that is completely controlled by writing. You see, uh, poetry wasn't. You had the Iliad and the Odyssey, which were just sung. They had all these uh, uh, formulas and, and themes that they could pump up any time they wanted. And the lyric poetry doesn't have to be. Oratory wasn't. People, Cicero wrote his orations after he gave them, sometimes two years after. But the theater had to be. How do we know that the theater, way back in ancient Greece, in the, in the fourth century before Christ, fourth and fifth century, it was already write, writ, written. Why do we know it? Because of the choruses. You see, when you have a large number of people reciting exactly the same words together, you have to have writing. Because we know from oral cultures that they can never do that. They have no instances of that. So you've got, first of all, a paradox. Now watch what happens when you, when you, get, when you get writing in control of an essentially telling a story. Uh, first of all, the theater is strange in that there is no narrator, right? You just have people talking. Nobody yeah, tells you, yeah. Is, well, yeah, but that's a, that's a later sophistication. Yeah. You know. But originally, you don't have somebody saying, now he's, this is so-and-so and he's gonna say something to this man, so he says it. And you, that's what a narrator does. Um, so a uh, theater, there's no, at least the beginning, no visible narrator. You can cross these genres up afterwards when they get developed and mix them. But what happens in the theater is you get a very tight plot right away. You know, you can get the Agamemnon or you can get uh, 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 Oedipus Rex, Sophocles, and this thing builds up very neatly to a climax and bam, the recognition hits you and then there's a denouement. And you come out just with a real uh, catharsis, you know. Do you know that until the end, almost the end of the 1700s, just about 200 years ago. So far as I know, there was not one single prose narrative in the entire world that was told with that kind of tight structure. Tom Jones, stringy, isn't it? One episode after another. Just, uh, Jane Austen has it. But Jane Austen was a woman, and she did not go to school the way the men did. She did not learn this or rhetorical tradition, the old oral tradition which came from classical antiquity. Nobody's ever studied that, the real, women of influence, real, real influence of women on writing. Uh, 
the problem was with the, with the narrative that there was a narrator and he could never quite get over the feeling that he was telling a story out loud. You know how in the, in the, even in the 19th century you get that dear reader bit? Dear reader? Dear reader? You know how the, 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 in, in the early 19th century novelists put that? That's because they can't believe it's a reader. They got to put that in to try to keep it readjusting themselves to the fact that they're not just telling a story. So this is one of the things that happens. You see the tight plotting and the fact that the theater fits right into that slot. That could have been true in classical antiquity. It's because of the control of writing. Now, of course, you can play games with this, and today we have action theater and all these sorts of things, but they are interesting because you had this thing to start with, and then there are variations on it. Would you, uh, as I understood it, when you were saying that uh, what influenced him anyway toward his fictionalization of the audience was uh, the news reporting and sports writing. Sports, sports particularly. Sports writing and uh, war reporting. You see, any news reporting can give you this immediacy. But what gives you the buddy effect, we've been there together thing, you know, you and I, that comes from really from what are called anthropologically male bonding structures, the forming of gangs. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 and the kind of, 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 uh, of it's really a bracing effect that a man gets out of knowing that I can rely on this fellow. You know, it's a, that teamwork effect. He's always there. I do this, he'll do that. And that comes about in sports and war. So you add the immediacy, the immediacy of the reporting, of the, uh, which could, uh, the, 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 the uh, yes, a virtual instantaneous reporting. You add to that this bonding structure, and then you get the Hemingway syndrome or effect. And Hemingway makes a big deal of this, doesn't he? He's hunting and all that kind of thing. He's he's a little bit uh, it's a little bit too much for him. And Hemingway, it's been pointed out, is is, is a little bit uh, an overgrown boy, and he he can't he can't adjust to women. There are no women in Hemingway or Mount anything. I mean, he just can't. His, his relationship to women, there's something wrong with it. Oh, all right. You see, I'm, I'm not sure, sure we agree that we actually synchronize that closely with what we see. Well, uh, they do and they don't. Let me give you an example, which I think will illustrate the problem, and I believe you have in mind for everybody. In the one of the um, opening essays in the New American, the American Heritage Dictionaries by Richard Oman at Wesleyan University. And it's called Grammar and Meaning. The opening essay is in that, that uh, uh, index of Indo-Germanic roots at the end make that dictionary invaluable. The middle part of the dictionary you can throw away as far as I'm concerned. The, dic the, the definitions are absolutely incompetent at times. And uh, it's, uh, it's a meretricious dictionary in the strict sense of meretricious. Putting on all yes, putting on all kinds of jewelry and pictures, and to, to make uh, make inviting what really isn't. Um, uh, it isn't quite that bad, but uh, but it, the in, the the body of the dictionary doesn't impress me much, um, and I think that that usage panel threw me off too a bit. But uh, there are some fine features to it. One of these things is is, is uh, Professor Oman's essay. Now he gives this instance. Suppose you give a picture just a little card picture to 25 people, and ask them to describe in 25 or 30 words what they see on the picture. Well, one person will say, there's a grizzly bear in a telephone booth and a man is waiting outside trying to make a phone call. Another one will say, an irate motorist is stomping around on the pavement while a grizzly bear is leering at him through the, window, through the pane of a phone booth. Another one will say, a man has parked his car along the highway and is waiting impatiently while a bear is telephoned. So you'll get 25 statements, and presumably they'll all be different. Now, 25 true statements, completely accurate. No, you can, you can make no objection to it. One person says a bear, the other person says a grizzly bear, but they're both correct. One of them is more detailed than the other. Now, suppose you take 25 of these statements, a real 25, 20 or 30 words each, and just using the lexical resources there, not all the words in English, but just the words that are in those statements. 
ask yourself, how many statements can I make? Just using the words in the 25 sta uh, statements I have here, how many statements can I make about this picture that are accurate, true, and grammatical so that people in English can understand? You can vary the words in any way you want. You can say a grizzly bear stands in a phone book booth, a grizzly bear is standing in a phone booth, and so on. Well, uh, uh, Professor Oman likes to play with this sort of thing. And he came, he, he actually collected 25 statements. <laughs> You'd get a little different results if you collected another 25, but he collected his 25. And he put the whole thing on a computer. Does anybody want to guess how many, <laughs> how many statements you could come up with? Variations count as separate statements? Yes, yes, any variation at all of a word. Nineteen point eight billion. Now this is not even using, not even using, the all the words in English. This is just using words in twenty-five statements. Now it sounds ridiculous until you start thinking of comparable things. Suppose you went down to the Pius XII Memorial Library at St. Louis University, and copied out all the statements and all the books in the library that were not quotations, but which were say twenty-five or thirty words in length. Do you think it's likely that you'd find any two that were exactly the same? See, when you think about it, it's very unlikely, isn't it? Very unlikely. That's what language is. So that all language, and this is the point Dr. Ullman is making, I think the point that, that your question raises, all language is creative. There is not, there's no one thing to say about anything. So if a person tells you, I said it this way because that's the way it really is, well, that's true enough, but it doesn't say much. Why didn't you say it any of the other 19.8 billion ways that you might have said it, that the way it was the way it really is? The real reason you picked this is going to be largely subjective. You said bear because you couldn't tell a grizzly bear from a black bear. You said a car because you couldn't tell it was a Pontiac. Or you said a Pontiac because you wanted to show the fellow that was asking you this question how much you knew. This doesn't vitiate the fact that that's the way it is, but it shows you why what it shows you what you related the things out there to because there's no way to treat something out there without relating it to something else and so this is what you're involved in when you ask somebody to do a description it's a very complex thing it isn't just a computerized operation just pick them out here you have to teach them to recognize and again you have to have <coughs> heard other people doing these things so you know what the options are which means you have to read that's not my question. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a beautiful answer. I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> Ask it again. Uh, I'm trying to make the kind of differentiation that Hayek Howell makes between this, the map and the territory. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me we're suggesting that all maps, or at least 19.8 billion possible maps, are equally confusing or true about their territory. And if we're really concerned with truth, it seems to me that we're making assumptions that aren't justifiable by the nature of words being symbolic and arbitrary related to their reference. So when we get a TV show of our riot, our favorite show, and it's narrated by Simon Zagnew, that's one kind of show. If it's narrated by George McGovern, it's a different kind of that's show. That's right. There's different qualities of truth there. That's right. There are different qualities of truth. I've taken a very simple kind of, of instance here and one which is really removed from any except of any very general generalized context. What you say is absolutely true, uh, and it's 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 especially true because in the concrete, there is no statement independent of a real context, so that it is interpreted in terms of what people are thinking about now, and 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 a statement, which, if you look at each individual item is factually verifiable, may actually be very false, because it is, it is addressed to a question that exists in this context, which it doesn't really answer, or which it distorts. Is, that's, is that what you're saying? That, that's quite true. Well, there's no doubt of that. Mm -hmm. The two institutions writer fictionalizing an audience. Mm -hmm. In an essay test, there isn't, in any ordinary sense, an audience. 
and you're really not telling anybody anything that they don't know for their information or for any, you know, any reason like that. I, I'd be interested in comments about that. And secondly, the implications of what you said in the second part uh, of your talk about uh, texts using, using books. All right. The first question is a very, very real one. And it's a little different for you from what it is for me. Uh, when you, because I'm teaching upper division students and graduate students. Now the way I solve the problem of the essay for a graduate student is pretty simple, as maybe Betty Pollard remembers. I tell my graduate students to write their papers for the people they're reading. You're reading uh, articles in PMLA or the Swanee Review, this kind of thing. Talk to them. That's your audience, whoever it is. It's a, it's a fictionalized audience, but it's a real fictionalized audience. This, uh, this learned audience, right for them. So that solves it for them. I can tell my upper division students to do something like that. But when, when you get to lower division students, to high school students too, you have a real problem. And I think that this is where the real creativity of the teacher uh, is, is important. The teacher has to establish a kind of audience. You have to somehow or other get across to the student uh, some kind of reality he can talk to. Maybe it's by establishing a climate of discussion in the classroom so that you can pretend when the student is sitting at home that all the students are around him and they're about to have a discussion. He won't write it exactly the way he'll talk it, but at least he's got, or he can pretend that they're all writing to each other. I don't mean that he will do this explicitly. But that is a very real problem, and I don't know any one solution for it. I don't know any one solution for it. Uh, I think once I could give you the kinds of things that I would do. You know, this is partly my own style, you know, and everybody's got a different style. I would tell the students that they have to be a bit creative, even though they are just repeating things that they read in books. They still have to organize them in some kind of way that means something to them. They might imagine telling this to their little brother. That's fictionalizing. But imagine some specific audience like that. Now, the thing to do to remember is that you haven't solved the problem by just telling them what audience to, uh, to imagine. You have to uh, have given them some kind of, and en en enabled them to imagine this. They can't do it automatically because they don't tell this to their little brother. Remember that. They don't tell it to them. So they have to have read things where people are fictionalizing little brothers or doing something like this. And you have to, to guide them, and this is largely the kind of, in a, in a good class in literature, you can get them pumped up a little bit so that their imaginations are stimulated, though they might know, not know exactly what it is they're imagining, they can imagine something. That's the real problem. Does that say something to your first question? Uh, now the second question again, would you repeat it? Yeah, well, I'm the literacy that you're talking about is different from the literacy of 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. It seems to me has some implications for the expectations of the ending. Well, it has some implications for the use of texts. Yes. Well, as, as a matter of fact, the use of texts in classrooms has changed much more in the past 50 years than most people are aware. Um, 50 years ago, certainly uh, I wasn't in school 50 years ago, but, but um, uh, well, I guess I was, but I wouldn't remember what was going on. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, certainly, uh, say, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the texts were used quite differently. Now, they were used much more to memorize from, and that's largely gone in our culture, but it isn't gone in all cultures. And in Europe, one of the reasons you've had explosions in European universities, some of the reasons are the same as <coughs> here, one of the reasons is the, uh, the uh, uh, professor, if he was there at all, and then just hired somebody else to come in and take his place, would just read you his textbook, which had perhaps already been published. You don't do that anymore. Lectures really used to be lectures, readings from papers. Now what, what we've done is we've introduced much more class discussion. That was, used to be virtually non-existent. They were in place of the class made a lot of noise, but they repeated back what you told them. This was a hangover, you see, from the old oral culture, where if you didn't have a lot, a lot of things, uh, uh, facts rattling around in your mind, you couldn't find them. You just kept, it was necessary to do a lot of memorizing before. It's not so necessary now. So I think the use of, dis of discussion 
and uh, uh, discussions about text. I do this often. I'm doing it in a graduate class next Saturday. They're, they're, this class has have read certain things, and we're, and we're each one has to, we've got them paired up. Each one they're going to discuss these things in class. That's that's a new adaptation of the text. In other words, one of the things that's happening now is is I to put it in a nutshell. I think we talk much more about texts than we used to, whereas they used to repeat them. People used to memorize, you know, whole plays. Darayu kai parasadados gignun vai paides do it. Plus, priros men are desertes nero. Hemingway would write, I've been told, I've never seen this in print. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, he would write, I produce about 450 words a day. That was a good day, about one and a half typewritten pages. This is a pro. So you see, the, uh, there is an anxiety. It, it's a necessary anxiety connected to the writing. But, but it's over, it will be an over-anxiety for people who are completely unfamiliar with it. Writing is work. You can try to make a game out of, out of it, but you don't have to make a game out of learning to speak for a little child. He makes a game out of it himself. But with writing, you have to make a game. And so I think that's a good, that's a good stage to go through. But then, once you've got him so he's, uh, he or she, so that uh, the student is not completely paralyzed, got him loosened up, then you've got to teach them to tighten up the right way. <laughs> and then wh how do you do that? <laughs> I guess the, I would think that the way you do it at this point, you have to have them read. They have to have samples of the way people do tighten up. And uh, I, I, this is a rather bad news, I guess. I don't seem to have been able to devise a way to teach writing without having them read, but I just don't think there is any. So then here's where your own ingenuity comes into play. But I do, I've never heard of any place else that's tried exactly what you've tried here in this loosening up process. Quite sound. How long? Tell me, uh, how how long does that go on productively? I mean, uh, when do you figure now they they we've got to start putting a little backbone into this thing? Uh, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, two months. I mean, how does? Phil Gosh is very good with you know he's teaching. Uh huh. So teaching. Well, what are some of the different answers? I, I have no idea what the. It also depends on the rate. Yes, and it depends on the personality of the instructor. It depends on a whole lot of things. But what are the ranges here we're dealing with? Do some of you start stiffening up after two weeks, say? It takes three or four weeks to even get it. It takes three or four weeks as a minimum. Yeah, three or four weeks as a minimum. Uh, does everybody... But to get anything down. To get anything down, yeah. I, I think, uh, as I understand what you're asking, that uh, it takes about a semester as far as the range is concerned. Mm -hmm. You let them just splurge themselves for a semester well, or so. Again, uh, you know, it's dependent on individual, individual students. Individual students, yeah. Some the first day and are ready to uh, ready. Them, you know. Yeah. But uh, speaking generally, mm -hmm. as far as uh, mm -hmm. I see the program working here, it's basically... It takes about a semester. Mm -hmm. Good. Do, uh, do you uh, find that this at all increases, that kind of activity uh, increases their appetite for reading at all? Perhaps not. No, I think that would be good, yeah. And then I think, too, that's not to get to that backbone because the person has to say, you know, given that the atmosphere is such that, you know, can, one can't, you know, one fellow student can say, well, I don't understand this point, you know. Um, then you've got to try to clarify. Then, then you say, okay, you know, you're not communicating. Uh -huh. I, I would think that it would probably uh, be a good exercise for them, going on what this Jordanian young fellow said, if you could do what uh, is in the ordinary Boy Scout manual, although I see they've revised the Scout manual now and they've dropped the boy from it. Um, the, uh, there used to be one of the tests you had, and this was a good one. We just kind of thing we take in stride, but it's for some cultures, uh, apparently Arab cultures, be new. Just have a boy go out and look, or a girl go out and look at a um, store window, and describe exactly what is there. Maybe an assignment like that might be 
some worthwhile, or just uh, have, have them describe, have everyone describe as exactly as he can exactly how that table looks. They might not know how to start, but um, you could try. A lot of them wouldn't know how to start, but some might. And one thing that I find at the level that I operate, which isn't that, it's two years beyond yours, or a year beyond yours, uh, is it is extremely helpful to read the good papers of the, other, of the students to the class. It just Some of the people who don't write well, it just sets them right back on their heels. They have no idea that there are people right next to them who can write like this. And, and it gives them a, a good bit of um, a, a sense of rivalry, which can be productive, or at least a sense of what kind of thing they, they could be capable of, they are capable of, too. We've gone beyond our time. One more question? I have yes. one question I'd like to ask on reading. The tying in the oral reading, the, the reading, reading, and getting ready to write. <coughs> what do you do with an, an, an adult who is illiterate, and you're teaching them to read, say, in English or any language, but particularly in English? Uh, how can you teach them, or can you, without having them verbalize? In other words, read aloud. When oh, I read I, as a child in the first grade, I remember reading everything out loud. I think you would have to. I, I don't know. I've never done that. I've, I've worked with people who are not educated, but I haven't done that with them, you know, adults. But, but you would say reading aloud? I would think so. Does anybody else have experience of this? I don't see any other way. Yeah. Okay. I'm involved with teaching. There's a kind of, you know, there is a kind of... Yeah, there is this kind of parallel between the ontogenetic and phylogenetic evolution. The individual has to kind of go through a stages which parallel that of the whole race. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.